There we go. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, EMS Medicine Live. Uh, this is our seventh month doing this. We are moving past the Yogi God phase to the experienced uh, webinar producers that we hope we're going to become. Um, but EMS Medicine Live, uh, its goal at least is for all of us as community EMS physicians and academic physicians to come together and share our experiences. Uh, there is some board preparation as well. Uh, last month we had Chris Martin Gill from Pittsburgh do a, uh, a flight physiology talk, which was excellent. Uh, one side note, we apologize. We haven't got that video up on our webpage, but it should be up so, uh, shortly. Um, the big idea of doing a webinar is trying to get group involvement. Um, asynchronous learning is great. This is available on our webpage and on our Facebook page. Uh, but having folks come together to add their thoughts and their experiences is really what you're, we're looking for and uh, trying to get you involved. If those of you who are here, thank you. Um, there are three of us who are the uh, medical directors. Uh, myself, I look nothing like my picture anymore, but that's my department picture. Uh, we do have Derek Cooney, who looks just like that still, uh, who's the fellowship director here at uh, SUNY Upstate, and Brian Clemency from uh, SUNY Buffalo, who's their fellowship director as well. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I've already muted almost all of you, uh, except for Harry, um, just to keep the background noise to a minimum. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, um, best to text uh, or message EMS Medicine Live is my laptop, uh, which I kind of keep to the side um, to answer questions, and either we'll break in and ask Harry a question uh, or wait to the end. This is being recorded, obviously. Uh, you can come to it if you Google EMS Medicine Live, uh, you get our, link, our web page. If you Google EMS Medicine Live Facebook, you get our Facebook page, the first links for both. Uh, we'll have copies of our presentations and our videos. Uh, at the end, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, message us a question if you want. Um, if you're not asking a question, try to keep yourself muted. It just, there's a lot of background noise with lots of us being involved and it helps. Any serious problems, you can email me afterwards. Uh, we haven't had any problems major in the past seven months and hope it stays that way. Um, but if any major issues, let us know. Uh, we are fortunate today. I think this is a good topic for EMS Medicine Live. Uh, we're discussing rescue task forces. Uh, we're fortunate to have Harry Wallace. Uh, he is a past resident uh, in emergency medicine here at Upstate. Uh, did his EMS fellowship here as well. Um, gosh. Two, three years ago, Harry, I forget how long ago now. Uh, yeah, two about years. About two or three years, uh, left us, moved to uh, Portsmouth Regional Hospital. Uh, I do hate him thoroughly. He probably got a, a job most of us would enjoy. Uh, walked into an EMS medical director position at the hospital. Uh, is involved in both the local, uh, regional, and state levels uh, for EMS uh, development. Is also working with the Seacoast uh, Emergency Response Team as their physician. Uh, slash medical director and uh, has agreed to talk to us today about his experience with Rescue Task Force. And I want to take myself off of uh, video here if I can or not. Otherwise, I'm going to give it to Harry and uh, let him go ahead and start. And start. You good, Harry? Yeah, I'm good. I'm just wondering. Out. Yep, there we go. Okay. All right. Cool. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I would like to thank uh, Chris and Brian and Derek for putting this together. As I graduated and left Syracuse, I was hoping to find a way that we could all stay in touch and talk about what everyone else is doing. And I think this is the perfect platform for that. Um, given, obviously, all of the recent scenarios involving the active shooters, particularly after Sandy Hook, this concept of rescue task force teams has really come to the forefront and is in varying, uh, varying stages of progress throughout the country. My goal here is to outline what these rescue task force teams are, the impetus for them, and we'll talk about some of the other objectives after. As Chris had said, if you have any questions throughout, just text or let him know, and then we can either stop the talk and discuss them then, or we can discuss them at the end. So objectives today, we'll discuss the traditional role of EMS in immediate threat scenarios, 
will identify the impetus for change leading to these rescue task force teams. Identify and discuss terminology, which is, which is important because we have EMS, fire, and now law enforcement. We want to make sure we're all on the same page as communication is always essential. We'll discuss really what the difference between tactical medics and physicians are, such as my role in the CERT team and the rescue task force team, which they are two separate entities. We'll highlight interventions and thought process different in this environment versus traditional EMS. There really is a different role for the medical care that role in a different scenario and order in which we care for these patients. We'll talk about what we're doing here in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, within the past six to 12 months, we've actually made a lot of progress in this arena that I'm pretty happy with and proud of. Then we'll review a recent uh, active shooter drill, which we carried out here in New Hampshire. It was fairly timely. We just did this on Friday. Um, I have a couple pictures to share with you, and I'll uh, let you know what my experience was. It was somewhat limited. I was not in the talk. I was out uh, uh, down range with the team, and we're waiting on an official after-action plan, but I think that'll be something nice to discuss as well. So... Traditionally, and I, uh, prior to medical school, I had eight years experience in uh, BLS, so we used to drill on this pretty consistently. And traditionally, victims or patients would either be delivered to us or they would egress on their own. Um, after they arrived, we would triage and transport accordingly, staged far down from the danger. Uh, we would be in what was traditionally referred to or still is referred to as the cold zone. EMS was essentially kept away from the fight until that hot zone uh, where whatever was going on was made safe. We'll talk a little bit about tactical medicine because to understand the evolution of these rescue task force teams, I think it makes sense to look a little bit uh, into tactical medicine and what brought us uh, into those uh, highly trained operator teams that would come in such as SWAT when things got a little bit hairy. So tactical medicine essentially has been around since the days of Napoleon, uh, basically switched to civilian SWAT teams. The seminal event for this was at the University of Texas at Austin, where on August 1st, 1966, the sniper Charles Whitman shot and killed 15 people while wounding 31 others. Now this wasn't necessarily the impetus for tactical medicine, but this made law enforcement think about putting together highly skilled individuals with greater firepower to be able to deal with high threat scenarios. LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's Department were among the first to develop tactical teams in the country. Chris, it seems like my control keeps going in and out, just so you know, buddy. Uh, prior to 1989, medical care to SWAT teams came from regular civilians, which were staged, um, civilian EMS, civilian fire, uh, safe locations removed from the areas of operation. Now, this wasn't just these large active shooter events. This was standard uh, SWAT operations. After we got out of the Gulf War, this concept of getting medical care close to the fight was realized and implemented during Operation Iraqi Free. Um, this translated to the, civilian, uh, to the civilian environment as well. Oftentimes, as we see, um, we learn certain things in theater and those translate into the civilian environment because that provides us with that evidence-based medicine or experience. This evolved from tactical emergency medical support to tactical EMS and now tact uh, tactical medicine. Just different terminology to describe the same thing, but at this point now, universally is referred to as tactical medicine. So talking about lessons learned in the civilian arena, some of the seminal events that led to uh, the concept of rescue task force team, uh, rescue task force teams, uh, most recent to my memory, Columbine in 1989. When we sit back and look at the numbers uh, recently over the last decade or so, over 100 incidents according to FEMA with 250 people killed between 2000 and 2012 with a drastic rise uh, since 2008. Obviously, uh, a big event here in Connecticut Sandy Hook, the after action plan, after seeing what had taken place, the injuries and the response time, 
the conclusion was made that maximizing survival requires an updated and integrated system that can achieve multiple objectives simultaneously. So at this point, we have to be thinking about um, victim identification, care, extraction, uh, a couple other things we're gonna talk about in addition to the uh, threat. Department of Homeland Security made a statement in order to maximize lives saved. There is a need to get life-saving medical attention to the victims quickly. In previous active shooter incidents, the focus has been exclusively on law enforcement neutralizing the threat. So here we see we kind of have to make that transition from, although we have to certainly be cognizant of the threat to try to get people in as soon as we can, as opposed to staging far away, waiting away in that cold zone, at least if we want to help uh, maximize survival. So here now we come up to this concept of EMS in the warm zone. The hot zone obviously is where we have the active shooter. The warm zone is an area between the active shooter uh, and the, it's an area that has been cleared where we know there is an immediate threat, but that warm zone always has the potential to revert back to the hot zone. I'm gonna go over a little bit of terminology here. I don't wanna get too bogged down in it. I have uh, three or four slides. I'm gonna go through it somewhat quickly. Uh, this is the terminology that we came up with within the state and it's pretty universal throughout. It's just everyone needs to be on the same page when discussing these terms so that you're not on scene or at an event and someone's trying to communicate with you and you guys are on two different pages, especially in that potentially high threat scenario. So active shooter is defined as an individual or individuals engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a combined and uh, populated area. In most cases, active shooters use firearms and there's no pattern or method to the selection of victims. Ballistic protective equipment, ballistic protective gear, including body armor for the head and body, vest, gloves, knee pads, helmets, and shields. When we talk about a casualty collection point, or CCP, a location that is used for the assembly, triage, medical stabilization, and subsequent evacuation of casualties, may be an intermediary point between or prior to formal triage. Cleared, an area that has been searched and does not pose a threat, there's no perpetrator present. So if someone says that an area is cleared, uh, that it now becomes a warm zone because we know the perpetrator isn't immediately physically there. Definitions continued. This cold zone, um, which still exists, and prior to this concept of rescue task force teams, was far down when where EMS would stage, an area where there is no significant danger or threat which can be reasonably anticipated, area where triage and treatment of patients would occur, additional resources staged, and command functions carried out. Use the term concealment, structure that hides a person's exact location but can be penetrated by ballistic weapons, with an example, a sheetrock wall. The contact team, this is the first responding officers or security personnel who go directly to the ongoing threat, making contact as soon as possible, hopefully neutralizing the threat in order to minimize injuries and lives lost. So the contact team, depending on where we are, usually is the first couple responding officers. The rescue task force team uh, does not accompany this law enforcement members there independent. Cover an area generally impenetra uh, impenetrable to ballistic weapons such as a concrete wall, something that prevents a responder from being observed by the perpetrator, additionally provides direct protection from the hazard and threat. Now we get this area said to return the hot zone, an area where a direct and immediate life threat exists. It depends on current circumstances and its subjective. Again, uh, going back to that concept, once an area is cleared, uh, but the perpetrator is still at large, that warm zone does that, uh, have the potential to revert back into this hot zone, so we have to be cognizant of that. Uh, and again, as it states here, area is dynamic and may change frequently depending on the situation. Incident command, um, we're all familiar with incident command as definitions, I'm gonna skip that for us. I think that EMS and fire does the incident command portion very well, we drill on it constantly. So I will just, um, incident command posts, uh, field location where the primary functions of incident command are performed. Uh, oftentimes you may find that you'll have an incident command and then maybe a forward command as well, which will uh, talk to each other. So you might have one IC, but then there may be one or two uh, forward uh, command posts as well, which are communicating either intelligence or information back to the incident command center. Uh, point of, uh, point of wound care, the physical location, building, or otherwise, where the patient care is initiated at or near where the victim was injured. And now here we get into our definition of exactly what a rescue task force team is. A team or set of teams deployed to provide point of wound care to victims where there is an ongoing ballistic or explosive threat, 
these teams treat, stabilize, and remove the injured while wearing ballistic protective equipment in a rapid manner, the key there is rapid manner, under the protection of law enforcement. This response can be deployed to work in, but not limited to the following active shooter in a school, business, mall, healthcare facility, conference, special event, etc. Any other scene that is or has the possibility of ongoing ballistic or explosive threat. And I'll talk a little bit more about that second portion as we go over our actual event that was here in New Hampshire today. I'm sorry, on Friday. When we say that an area secured has been searched, it's now on direct law enforcement control. Uh, a secured area is different from a cleared area. Typically, teams will be moving through cleared areas, whereas a secured area, we now have a permanent presence. Soft target, a uh, person or thing that is relatively unprotected or vulnerable, especially to an attack, soft targets typically would include our victims we're caring for. Uh, and or we saw a lot of soft targets during our most recent event. That would be either teachers or students who were locked in a room attempting to keep themselves away from the threat. Uh, we're going to talk about this a bit uh, more later in the talk, but just briefly, uh, Tactical Emergency Casualty Care, TECC. These guidelines are a set of best practice recommendations for casualty management during high threat civilian tactical and uh, rescue operations, essentially based off the military's TCCC. Um, guidelines account for difference in the civilian environment, resource allocation, our unique patient population and scope of practice. Applications of the TECC guidelines for civilian fire EMS medical operations are far reaching beyond just the traditional application of tactical and law enforcement operations. So that's, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll talk uh, about how care for EMS from the traditional, you roll up to a house where someone's either having chest pain or difficulty breathing to rolling into a potential or into an immediate threat scenario where you have multiple victims whom you're trying to treat and triage rapidly. So talking a little bit about the tactical medicine, uh, medical position versus the rescue task force team, this actually has come up a lot. I've given this talk once at our hospital. I'm giving it uh, statewide at our statewide trauma conference in November. And quite often I'll have service line leaders or assistant or deputy chiefs coming up and saying, geez, Harry, how many guys do you need on um, the search team or the SWAT team? Isn't that what you guys are uh, proposing when you talk about these rescue task force teams? And they're, they're quite different. Um, and so I just want people to realize that because there's a role for both. So my role in the search team is uh, as their physician. And that role encompasses a number of different things. One is we had a full day of training where everyone got new uh, med kits. I'm gonna take two seconds just to give you my personal experience on the team and through my research uh, and what I've done previously, what I would recommend for people. Uh, everyone uh, obviously on the team has a med kit. They're familiar with it. Everyone has their own med kit in the same spot and has a couple essential things in it, which I will discuss later on in the talk that one day of training that we did, as I say, we went over everything within the medical kit, make sure everybody had it on the person's in the same spot. Reason being is your medical kit is for you. You don't want to take your medical kit and use it on someone else because then if you take an injury, now you don't have what you need either to self-treat or for someone else to come up and take care of you. We did that as well as ran a scenario through our simulation lab of an officer down who did uh, an active shooter in the hospital scenario with a brief scenario of coming into one of the rooms with the officer down and we were able to run that one pretty well. I say this because part of my role as physician on the team is education, at least from the medical standpoint. Uh, the other part is actually going uh, uh, down range with the team. So there's myself, another physician on the team, and a medic. What we do is try to deploy with the team. We're not in the stack, we're not the first ones in, but once we're able to at least clear an area where the second one's in, hopefully, and oftentimes we're right up on the scene in the back of the team. Our role in the team is essentially to care for operators down. Uh, we're there to protect the team, to keep them safe, to make sure everybody goes home at the end of the day. Our role is not typically to run in and start treating multiple civilians. This is where the transition from our role on the CERT team, taking care of the team, doing that education, going over medical kits, et cetera, making sure everyone's safe during the training, this is where it transitions to this role of the rescue task force team, which is, a, which is a different entity. So the role of the rescue task force team responder is their role to rapidly triage and treat multiple patients as they come into these warm zone scenarios. Uh, they typically should carry, we'll go over this one more time, equipment to deal with about six to eight casualties apiece in their first in day. And this is just rapid triage and treatment in the warm zone. They come in with law enforcement. They could either come in with the tactical team 
or in some scenarios, uh, they are built into the first responding law enforcement officers after those first two or three go in to at least clear the first part of the building. We can talk a little bit more about that after, but again, the role on the SWAT team is uh, multifactorial, dealing with the men and women on the team, and then that role for those rescue task force team members is dealing with the victims. So when I say, what do we have in common, that kind of leads me to my next slide, which is this T, uh, tactical emergency combat kit. This tactical emergency combat kit, I'm sorry, let's hang on one second. Guys, I apologize, we just got a puppy who'll be making his way outside. Uh, so what we have in common is this tactical emergency combat here. This TCCC is the military version. And what it does is it kind of changes the order in which we think about patients and how we treat patients. So for example, as I had alluded to before, when you're on the back of an ambulance roll to a house with someone who has difficulty breathing, your first thought is maybe airway, take a listen to the lungs, uh, what medications are they on, what immediate treatment do I need to do, maybe it's some oxygen. Uh, in these scenarios, it's quite different because you're looking at significant injury, whether it be penetrating injury, ballistic injury, and those are the things you need to deal with first. So it kind of switches the order in which you treat patients, and it also uh, switches in your role of rapidly treating and triaging and then moving on. That thought of patient abandonment, I have to stay with my patient now that I've initiated care, this is a separate uh, type of scenario where doing the most interventions for the most people will maximize survivability, as opposed to just maybe one or two individuals at a medical scene. So essentially, a lot of what we have now came out of the many lessons learned from the wars in Iraq and, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. It's unfortunate, but a lot of things happen in theater that then translate back home and uh, one of the things that comes out of that, fortunately, is that we're able to make better decisions about what we do in the civilian environment. So again, that change in mindset from traditional pre-hospital medicine where you're dealing with a medical patient, uh, as I say, maybe one or two medical patients, uh, now to dealing with multiple patients who have taken uh, significant injury that if we don't intervene, uh, if we don't intervene quickly, uh, the chances of them surviving are very slow, not slow. So talking about this tactical emergency combat care, um, here are the goals. Save preventable deaths. Prevent additional casualties from taking place. Rapid, and again, rapid EMS trauma assessment, and then rapid treatment of life threats. This is that, uh, again, that switch. Bleeding before breathing. Lose so much red, you're dead. Same concept. Uh, hemorrhage is one of the big things we're going to look at. We'll have some evidence as to why we do that in a second, and then timely evacuation. The approach recognizes a particularly important principle. It's to perform the correct intervention at the correct time in a continuum, and again, this is a continuum of tactical care. A medically Correct intervention performed at the wrong time in a potentially hostile environment may lead to further casualties, uh, the victim being uh, injured more so and or uh, medical personnel sustaining injury as well. So basically it's making that decision as, um, as when to treat and what to treat. Then we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, so here's where we come up with uh, combat deaths and what we potentially could have done uh, to either maximize survivability or prevent further mortality or morbidity. So killed in action, 31% penetrating head trauma. So unfortunately with that 31%, there's not too much we can do. 25% surgically uncorrectable torso trauma, 10% potentially correctable uh, torso trauma, 9% hemorrhage from extremity wounds, 7% mutilated glass trauma, 5% tension in thorax, 1% airway problems, and 12% from infections or complications of shock post-injury. So the ones we've highlighted here, hemorrhage, tension, and thorax, and every problems are the ones we can potentially make a difference here. 
So preventable causes of combat-related deaths. So we're not talking about that head trauma, that ballistic injury, that uh, unsurgically correctable torsional trauma. We're now talking about things that we can intervene in and make a difference and hopefully prevent uh, further mortality and morbidity. 60% of preventable trauma was hemorrhage from uh, extremity wounds, 33% from tension in the thorax, and 6% from some type of airway obstruction, axillofacial trauma, for example. Um, the data we've come up with has been extrapolated all the way back from Vietnam to present day Iraq and Afghanistan. There are essentially three stages of care. Care in a potentially hostile environment, tactical field care, and then tactical, uh, tactical casualty evacuation care. So three different modes of taking care of these patients uh, with these risky task force teams. Care in uh, a potentially hostile environment. So this thing, so EMS shall not be armed. With these rescue task force teams, EMS um, would not carry weapons. Now, again, highlighting the difference between our role on the, or at least my role on CERT and the role of SWAT teams, when you look nationally, uh, medical personnel that work with SWAT teams, 50% are armed and 50% are not. The majority of those who are armed are sworn officers, uh, officers in one form or another, and are either uh, medics or PAs. Uh, but in this instance, when we're talking about rescue task force teams, uh, EMS would not be armed in these scenarios. Having said that, that does not mean that they would be unfamiliar uh, with the weapons utilized by law enforcement because there's always the potential of a downed officer or operator, and EMS should be aware of at least how to make the weapon safe uh, and or, of course, um, for self-defense should... Um, the perpetrator or whomever be approaching them, they need to defend themselves and or the officer down. So available medical equipment, you know, obviously is limited to what can be carried by the medical first responder. So talking about some of the essentials we need to keep in here, because we really just kind of want to keep it down and dirty, tourniquets, uh, chest seals, and 10 or 14 gauge catheters for chest decompression, trauma dressings, nasal airways, hemostatic dressings, space blankets, and casualty tags just down and dirty, bare essentials, so you can carry the most amount of equipment to affect something with these preventable deaths um, for the most amount of people. So tactical field care, this is the care rendered by the medic once it has been determined by police that the scene is no longer under direct threat, and this is the warm zone. Um, again, that hot zone is where there is an active threat, and then this is, um, we're talking more about the warm zone. Just as a quick caveat, I was talking to my guys about what uh, what we do in a hot zone environment, if someone takes a hit to an extremity, the only thing we're doing in the hot zone environment is maybe putting the cat on. Otherwise, we're just returning fire. The best medicine in the warm zone is bullets. So these guys are just continuing to return fire at the threat if possible. If they get a second, the only thing they're worried about doing is throwing up, turning it on if it's necessary based on the type of wound they have. And that's talking about for you guys who are either on uh, tactical teams or thinking about starting a medical team for a local tactical team. Uh, once we're in the warm zone, available medical equipment is still limited to those that can, uh, to what you can carry in. You're not going to have multiple people coming into the, uh, you're not going to have multiple people coming onto the scene that's going to be difficult to resupply, although there is a plan for that, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but basically, what you have in your first in bag is what you have to treat. So the time to evacuation can vary considerably. Again, this is a very fluid and dynamic scenario. You may be able to get in and treat, and all of a sudden you walk into an atrium and you have eight victims, you can treat them all, you're out of supplies, and now it's time to consider evacuation. If the egress is clear, then you get everybody out of there. If it's not, for example, maybe there's a fire, maybe the threat has now moved behind you, now you may have time to sit down and re-triage everyone and see if there aren't other things you can intervene in once you've addressed those life-threatening scenarios. So talking about evacuation, rapid extrication of a casualty, and there are several different devices which you can use, mega movers, uh, skeds, drags, etc. cetera. Um, and again, if you can utilize the, these devices, it's much more uh, reasonable to be able to place one or two patients and have a single individual be able to drag them out as opposed to putting four bodies on a litter and carrying it. Now, if you have stairs or something else, obviously the scenario changes, but uh, the least amount of bodies you can use to successfully extricate these patients the better off you are because it's going to leave your medics freed up to treat other patients as they continue to move forward and you're going to need law enforcement freed up because they're going to need more guns uh, just because the threat hasn't been neutralized yet. Additional medical personnel and equipment can be staged for instant command for additional casualty management 
and rapid transport to appropriate hospital destination. So we're talking a little bit here about that casualty collection point that still needs to be set up. We still need to have ambulances staged, obviously, as we do in traditional medicine. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, our experience became a little hairy actually getting the patients out of the building we were in to a casualty collection standpoint because the threat of the shooter was still present and you don't want to be rolling an ambulance up there uh, if you can just stick a gun out the window and start shooting at the cab. Care in a hostile environment. Minimal attention to airway at this point because the need to evaluate the casualty quickly. Again, we're not talking about intubating patients or anything along those lines. Uh, control of hemorrhage is essential since injury to a major vessel can result in hypervolume shock in a short time frame. As we all know, get a major vessel two to five minutes later, you can exsanguinate. The average person, again, can exsanguinate in that two to five minute period with a major vessel injury, for example, a femoral artery disruption. That was a video at one point. I think most of us have probably seen it uh, for a quick lot of whatever, where they uh, lacerate the uh, uh, pig's femoral artery. Tourniquets, of course, these are makeshift tourniquets here, but just talk about uh, just emphasizing the importance of tourniquets to control uh, hemorrhage. Tourniquets should be placed uh, approximately two to three inches. Now, but there was some conversation about this that the new guidelines are bringing up right to the that transition zone or joint and strap it down. Uh, or the traditional thing, two to three inches above the injury as soon as possible during clothing. I've talked to a couple trauma surgeons. I, I'm still advocating for the two or three inches above the injury. If a second tourniquet needs to be placed, so be it. You're going to get a certain amount of vasospasm anyway. Uh, and at least if it's as close to the wound as possible, you're going to give the surgeon the most amount of real estate to work with when they're either trying to salvage the extremity or thinking about uh, some type of joint replacement. If someone has a significant injury in the tip fib area, right, and we wrap this thing all the way up around the groin, then we may have taken away this patient's ability to simply have a uh, BKA or below the knee amputation device, and now they're looking at a whole uh, extremity device. So again, I know there's a little bit of talk about this now, whether you bring it all the way up to those transition zones, by that I mean the shoulders and hips insecure, or if you go two or three inches above the injury. Uh, at this point, for my guys, after those conversations, I'm still uh, recommending the two or three inches above the injury. And just a little, uh, I'm going to put a little plug in here for the cat. I have no affiliation with them. I don't work with them. Uh, but I do think that it has been tried in combat and has passed the test. There are a number of other alternative devices out there. Uh, I've run into a number of them, many of which I don't like for various reasons. If you guys would like to discuss this at some point, I'd be happy to discuss it with you, uh, talking about different brands and why I prefer the cat. The only uh, disadvantage to the cat is you really need one of those practice uh, uh, scenario cats, I, I believe they're blue in color, because this is plastic, so you don't want to train with it constantly because then when you need in combat, it might break on you, but certainly they've had no incidents of failure with one to two applications. So kind of some of the key points uh, when dealing in these uh, warm zones or media threat scenarios, airway management beyond placing an MPA is really best deferred until after. Um, we're just bringing needle crites back in the state of New Hampshire for paramedics. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to uh, start thinking about doing a needle cryothyrotomy or surgical cryothyrotomy here uh, under these immediate threat scenarios with multiple patients. So really, I would just recommend uh, opening the airway and placing an MPA. Again, oftentimes we talk about cervical spine stabilization, especially in blast injuries. This is really a quick and dirty doing the best we can for the most amount of people. So if someone's not breathing, you know, forego the cervical spine injury, open the airway best you can and pop the MPA. Stabilizing life-threatening hemorrhage now with a commercially available tourniquet. Now again, it don't, um, it's really hemorrhage before airway in this instance. So you really want to make sure that you, if you see someone bleeding, that you address that bleeding right away because there's only so much blood. Even when we're talking about getting the patients off the immediate scene and back to the hospital, the hospital itself is only going to have a supply of so much blood. So whatever we can do to stop the hemorrhage as soon as possible is important. Uh, consider hemostatic presence and trauma pressure. We'll um, highlight a couple of those in a second and just reassure the casualty. If you happen to be with just one person or you're transporting one person, don't forget the importance of continuing to speak with them every 15 to 20 seconds. It keeps them engaged. Uh, and it also keeps you aware of any potential deterioration if all of a sudden they're talking to you 30 seconds later or not. 
continuing uh, the initial assessment, bleeding control before breathing. I'm sorry, yeah, bleeding control before breathing. Again, you only get so much blood, and once you lose that, uh, the patient's really in trouble. Nasal airways, no advanced airways. Uh, place in the left lateral common position to maintain the airway opening. Uh, no CPR rescue breathing. We just don't have the time for that. And as you guys know, uh, rescue rates for traumatic arrest are extremely low. Rapid treatment and evacuation. Really just treating and getting them out of there is the whole goal of this. Ongoing assessment, uh, airway advanced uh, as needed or as is appropriate. O2 assisted, again, oftentimes we're not gonna have an O2 uh, tank. With us, this would be something more after we get them to the casualty collection standpoint, I'm sorry, the casualty collection point uh, and or that uh, field triage area. Circulation, IV, IO access, fluid resuscitation. I will tell you guys in my bag for the team, I do carry, um, I do carry an IO drill. So just an example of how we can lay somebody to keep them protected. Open the airway with the chin lift. Again, as I said, uh, we're not gonna worry too much about cervical spine stabilization, but um, at least if you can get that airway open and or throw an MPA and we're giving them some shot. And again, placing them on their side, uh, even in case they start to vomit, we certainly don't want to make things worse. You guys are familiar with nasal airways. Breathing, sorry, I flip it through here. Traumatic chest wall defects should be closed quickly with inclusive dressing. We know this. Uh, I prefer inclusive dressings with a vent because you never know when the patient's going to be placed or in the back and someone will, may or may not notice. Uh, that they have a chest seal on. Obviously, the recovery position again, because you could have multiple issues going on, not just the penetrating chest wound, just an example of an actual chest seal with the one way valve. And someone, and I know you guys know this, but um, someone had asked me, geez, how are these chest seals? Uh, definitive one device treatment for pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax? No, they're not. Obviously, as we know, they're just there to make sure that it doesn't become worse. Another example of the same chest seal. We carry a uh, hyphen chest, uh, those of you uh, uh, thinking about supplying your team, I had high, uh, hyphen chest seals with a uh, one-way vent. Talking about needle decompression rates, we talked about that 60% hemorrhage, we already discussed the capture, and again, now we're talking about that 30, 33% with tension pneumothorax. The only thing I would say to this with you guys, it's even been done amongst physicians and ED physicians, is when you're looking to get placement in that mid to line, just put your fingers between um, between the sternal notch and that AC joint. And you'll be surprised because even I found myself wanting to go more medially than I should. And you certainly want to stay away from those medial, uh, medial, medial style structures when you decompress. So I actually physically would put my thumb and forefinger in the space and go right in between uh, when I decompress. Just because it's a kind of intense situation if we're decompressing someone and it's, it's believe it or not, even if you test yourself and go to work the next time, it's easy to try to go a little bit more medial than you should. The other thing I'll say here, and I point, I highlight it when we get a little bit further in talking about what you may want to carry in your risk and task force team, don't forget about your pediatric patients. Uh, obviously, with Sandy Hook, the majority of casualties were kiddos. Uh, when you're thinking about decompressing a pediatric chest, a 10 or 14 gauge isn't what you're looking for. You'd want something more long than 18 or 20. So I carry 18s and 20s as well, and uh, that's something you guys may want to consider. Uh, God forbid you roll into a scenario with the school and you need to decompress a kid. Uh, talking a little bit about circulation. As we're now moving from that immediate threat environment, whether your egress has been installed or you're now able to get the camera zone, any other bleeding that had not been addressed should now be addressed. Uh, minimum of clothing removed. Um, do your best to search for injuries otherwise. Hemostatic dressings. Uh, there are a couple out there. Uh, direct to the site and hold for 20 minutes. If any of your guys have old med kits and they still have the old powder, the quick clock powder, please try to get rid of that. Oftentimes, people aren't checking their med kits or med bags. Even if this is something as simple as an email uh, to your local team, uh, just to ask them to take a peek uh, because, as you know, the powder's uh, no longer used. After four minutes, if it's ineffective, you may try to apply a new dressing. I mean, honestly, at this point, if it's ineffective, you've probably already thrown a cat around it, and uh, you're going to leave that on until it gets to the hospital. You should not apply additional dressings over the ineffective dressing. You can pack uh, wounds with cause, especially those penetrating chest wounds. Battle dressing bandage to secure the hemostatic dressing in place so it doesn't get moved in transit. Uh, do not remove the dressing if the bleeding is controlled. Some examples, quick clot combat cause, 
is nice in that it rolls out for you so you may use it to fill those penetrating wounds as well as opposed to just uh, something that's a bit more open and accessible. IV fluids, I'm not going to say too much about this. Uh, I carry one bag on me to treat the guys on the team. Uh, I can't imagine that we have the time or luxury to be starting a lot of IOs and fluid. It may, you may want to bring one or two bags in with you just in case, as I said, either egress is halted for one reason or another, or you do have a little bit more time to address any dangers going on. Um, so that's basically, I put this only because that's all you're looking for. It's a BP greater than nine. I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit quickly because I don't want to bore you guys. I know you know a lot of this stuff already. Uh, secondary injuries deferred until after the evac. Obviously, we've been talking about treating immediate threats right away which include hemorrhage, airway, and tension of the thorax. The rest of it can be taken care of then uh, upwards. Tactical evac. We have to assume at some point uh, the casualty will be evacuated. Time to evac being quite variable for all the reasons I had mentioned before. Perhaps there's a fire that breaks out, perhaps the threat moves to a new location. So you may find yourself with more time to sit and care for your patients further triage and evaluate. Of course, the mass casualty event may exceed the capabilities of the medic. I think we should all probably anticipate that as, as it is usually the case. Just uh, some examples of how to leave as we have mega movers and steps here. Uh, and again, the most amount of patients you can place on these with minimal personnel to evac them, the better off you are, uh, just because you don't have a lot of hands on deck uh, to try to get these patients out. They need to move further down to treat and triage additional victims and or move in to engage the threat. So documentation of care is important. In an ideal world, you'd be able to document these things, at least on a triage tag as you're sending the patient out. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what happened during our most recent event, but I'll be perfectly honest, the one thing that suffered was documentation due to manpower and the amount of injuries we had in addition to the real estate we were trying to deal with as far as how large schools were on uh, documentation to the hit. So just briefly, in summary, um, what we want to do is the most amount of good for the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time. Preventable deaths, secondary to hemorrhage tension and thorax and airway obstruction, which is hopefully what we can intervene with the devices which I've discussed. Um, I said I would mention before what I had once we got through this from my guys in their med kit. Uh, each of my guys in their med kit, they carry uh, nasal pharyngeal airway, gloves, combat gauze. Uh, I gave them the H wrap. Uh, you may also look at uh, investing in an Israeli advantage, which works really well for compression as well. My guys each have two cap tourniquets on them, and they keep them one in each leg uh, on their uh, in their uh, pants on each side, so that no matter where they take a hit, if they do, they'll be able to access a cap one way or the other. The caps are also preformed, so you just have to throw them out in a loop and put them on. That can be done one-handed. Uh, an example of some of the drills I have my guys do, we do them blindfolded. Um, and we do them without the use of one limb just to get everyone uh, used to being able to throw these on either if they take an eye injury and they're in complete darkness for one reason or another or they've actually had loss of a limb and can no longer use it. So just some of the drills with the cat and you'll be surprised as to what people like and don't like about it. We've modified ours a little bit and then also where they want to keep it so they can have access to it uh, at all times. Um, in addition to that, uh, I don't, I guess, don't have 14 gauge needles for needle decompression. Uh, the team is comprised of law enforcement officers, myself, the medic, and the other doc are the only ones familiar with uh, needle decompression. Having said that, if you guys are interested in it, there was a pretty good study where they did education with law enforcement officers to recognize attention pneumothorax and how to deal with it, and they tested them six months later and they still did well with it. Uh, so it's not that it can't be done, we've just chosen uh, not to do it because we're so close um, downrange with the guys. Um, but again, that's something that you guys could consider. It has been done and has been demonstrated to work in the past as well. Any questions with what we keep in the kit, I'd be happy to address after we email after the talk. Last thing I'll say, I usually have a small, uh, small thing of duct tape with them as well, duct tape or gorilla tape. There are so many things you can treat with that, and I put that in the med kit as well, just in case you have the jury based on their 
that or something as well. So what does a rescue task force team look like? Well, typically it's a one-to-one -one or two-to-one law enforcement to EMS ratio. Now again, we have those first responding officers who go in, attempt to clear the threat, secure the scene, so that we can at least make entry uh, into wherever the threat is without running the risk of taking direct fire. We want to stay away from that, obviously. We want to keep everybody safe. We want to get everyone in there to treat everyone, but we have to do so in such a manner that uh, law enforcement at least goes in and clears uh, so that we can then go in. And when I say we, I mean medical providers, we can then go in with some level of protection. And typically that's a law enforcement officer in the front and back or in a diamond formation with law enforcement officer in the front, back, and both sides with uh, one to two rescue task force medics in the middle. Holistic protection in the form of vests and helmets. Um, we discussed a little bit about this earlier under the definition of holistic equipment. Vests are rated one through four at this time. One is not recommended. And then it goes uh, other two, three, a three, uh, and then up uh, two, I'm sorry, 2A, 2, 3A, 3, 4. I believe at this point our best is 3A. Um, but you definitely want your guys protected because, again, that warm zone can refer back into a hot zone, and we don't want to be throwing people in the mix if they're not appropriately protected. And, again, as I said, the first two officers are usually clear and follow behind. Again, we use that terminology, clear and not secure. A secure area is where we have an active law enforcement presence uh, continually to keep that room secured. In this instance, we're talking about clearing rooms and then going in with uh, with protection in that either forward and back or diamond shape uh, scenario. So security is provided, as I mentioned, as you move through the area, you're providing uh, that tactical emergency combat care for the maximum number of patients for the most benefit. Again, as I said, your first in bag should typically be ready to treat six to eight victims with all the stuff we had just discussed. Uh, as far as hammer treatment, uh, et etc. And again, as I said, don't forget to anticipate those pediatric patients. Make sure you have uh, equipment in your bag to address any issues they may have. To be perfectly frank, for the most part, I think much of what you have in your bag uh, would be okay in a situation like this for that pediatric patient. The only scenario I came up with was that decompression where you might need a smaller needle. And evacuation becomes the focus when you can no longer continue forward or you've exhausted your supplies. So now you're done doing the most amount of good you can for the most amount of people. Now we just have to get them out of there and get them to the hospital. We have to get them to the ambulance and the treatment we triage and then transport them to the hospital. This part is essential to train with law enforcement to figure out what strategy works best for moving and switching up the teams. Um, it's essential to know how you guys want to move forward. And I'll give you an example. One of the first times I was training with the guys on the CERT team, something as simple as going through a doorway uh, with somebody protecting me, it became a question. Well, do I wait here until you clear the door and have to go behind you? How do you want me to go? And now after working with the guys for so long, I go with them, I keep a hand on the operator in front of his back so he knows exactly where I am. If he goes down, I go down. We work almost together as one. So when we cross that threshold, we're crossing it together. But this is why it would be essential to train because you want your medics and law enforcement officers using the same terminology and knowing how they want to move through a building that hasn't been secured or is not yet secured but has simply been cleared. So again, terminology and movement are two things uh, that you definitely want to be on the same page with. And that's why training is so important because chances are, depending on who's on shift, the four individuals or six individuals, depending on how that team looks with security um, ratio to the number of medics going in, these guys and girls may have never met before. So making sure everyone trains and everyone's on the same page, using uniform language and, tact and tactics is essential. So I kind of raised this as a question because when I gave this talk, I started talking to the audience a little more. What are some of the issues that need to be addressed to start off? Well, from my personal experience, and I spent, I'm going to jump uh, ahead a little bit. I talked a little bit about what we're doing in New Hampshire. We put together a stakeholder meeting of law enforcement, including state and local police, um, Office of Emergency Services, fire, and uh, local fire departments as well, because we really needed to have that stakeholder meeting to make sure everybody wanted to do this. We had to make sure everybody was on the same page, and if they weren't, what were the concepts or, or, or 
misconceptions they had that, that uh, prevented them from being on the same page as everyone else and trying to get this thing rolling out. We had a total of four to five meetings, one to two hours apiece. This was up in Concord at the State Fire Academy. And eventually we were able to hash out a best practices document, which I'll talk about later. I bring this up only because really the bigger picture issues uh, that we really just need to get people, first and foremost, administration to sit down, the chiefs to sit down and agree that this is something we need, and then we need the unions to sit down and say, yes, this is something that we think would be a benefit. And then lastly, we have to work on the budget because we need the manpower and training hours to be able to do it. So these are just some of the basic logistics that we were running into problems with before we could even get off, um, before we could even get this thing off the ground and have people start training together and identify issues for training. So unique scenarios here in New Hampshire, I put this up because uh, as with many, as I'm sure this is not unique just to New Hampshire, but many of you experience the same, you do have areas where you maybe have only basic EMTs, that you don't have advanced level providers, whether it be an advanced EMT or paramedic, uh, and or you may have one or two law enforcement officers, and or the state police who are covering a fair amount of real estate with just maybe one or two troopers or one or two officers. So that complicates things in that it's difficult to formulate a rescue task force when you have a limited number of people involved. Now, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it's probably going to take you a little bit more time to ramp it up. And the other question that we asked ourselves, at least on the medical control board, will we put together a waiver or additional education so that those individuals who want to be appropriately trained at the BLS level, for example, to do a needle decompression, did we think that was something safe we could do and did we want to provide that waiver for them to be able to do it? So that's some of the situations that came up. Again, that's a big deal because that tension in the door actually is 33% of preventable deaths. And these incidents don't just happen in places where, uh, you know, there's a large population and a lot of resources available. Um, and here's some common kind of barriers to implementation. I've addressed one of them already. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, our roles as medic, uh, uh, tactical medics and physicians is the same as the role of medics on rescue task force teams, and that is not the case. Just because your local uh, SWAT team has uh, individuals who are medically trained and are with the team does not preclude a role for the rescue task force teams, and quite honestly, it's not our role on the scene to take care of all these individuals. Um, again, just something based simply on supplies, I don't carry that many supplies with me to be able to treat that number of victims. Secondly is finances. A lot of people kind of balked at the cost of ballistic equipment. Well, the reality is you don't need to outfit, for example, one of my services here has 20 paramedics on it. I don't need to outfit 20 paramedics with ballistic equipment. I need to buy three to four sets of ballistic equipment. They're very common in size and keep them on the command vehicle. Now, we can test on everyone, make sure that it fits everyone, but you keep those uh, two to four sets in the command vehicle. So if we Google something like this out, you're only going to send in two to four uh, rescue task force medics. Uh, you can resupply those medics as they come out and re-enter the building again. That's an easier thing to do as opposed to having to come up with a budget where you outfit 20 paramedics with more ballistic equipment. It's unnecessary and honestly unrealistic with the way budgets are these days. So a couple of the questions about money and time came in, um, and that was one some of the big barriers. The other one is that you have to have buy-in, and I alluded to this in the first question, I, I didn't allude to it, I mentioned it, that you have to have buy-in from administration and then buy-in from the unions. It's essential that everyone's on the same page with this and they want to get it done. So again, what we're going to be doing here in New Hampshire, that, stoke, that stakeholder meeting I alluded to, we had those five meetings lasting about almost two hours apiece, and we finally came up with a best practices document. We debated on whether making this a strict protocol or a document, we opted to make it a document because of some of those situations we're going to encounter uh, where we have a limited amount of resources. We didn't want to um, cage any department or a group of departments into a certain uh, one-size-fits-all scenario and make it a protocol. We're still having a discussion about whether or not to do a waiver with education in some of those areas, for example, for needle decompression with tension in the thorax. But we did get this best practices document out and pushed it through. Uh, medical control board up to the governor for sign and it's available on our website if you guys are interested in checking out the New Hampshire Williams website. Um, we looked at what a lot of other individuals had done to help develop this. So if you guys don't have one and are thinking about developing one as far as a protocol and or best practices document entailing rescue task force teams, 
A lot of states have done a lot of good work already, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So those resources are out there, and I would be happy to discuss them with you so you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, for a while, I was also medical director. Uh, we have five different regions in the state here. Uh, I'm currently in Region 3, uh, which is Portsmouth Fire and a lot of the other surrounding communities. I have 15 departments under me right now. I had up to 32 departments under me when I was out in Region 2 as well, the largest of which was uh, Dairy Fire and Dairy PD. I have subsequently stepped back because I just didn't have the time or resources to manage this many different departments. Um, I highlight this because uh, Jerry Fire and Mary Pini and I were well into getting these rescue task force teams on the ground. We had purchased ballistics equipment. Uh, I had given a portion of this talk with regards to TECC, and we had done one to two training scenarios with uh, Jerry Pini and Jerry Fire already. So uh, we're already making headway here in the state getting this out and rolling, uh, which I'm pretty happy with considering back at the I think with last fall, we initially began having this discussion at the state level about rescue task force teams. So I put this up here, examples of successes. Well, this isn't necessarily a rescue task force team, but when you look at the Boston Marathon bomb and the after action plan, uh, the amount of life lost was minimized for essentially two things. One is the nature of the explosive devices. They were low to the ground, so most individuals suffered extremity injuries only. They didn't take direct chest or head trauma secondary to the blast. Additionally, resources were immediately available. We had first responders breaking down the fence and jumping over to help people. We had ambulances on scene. The treatment tent is right towards the tail end. Of the, uh, this is, this is a, just before the first bomb goes off. You can see the treatment tent is just beyond the finish line there. Uh, so we were able to treat, triage, and manage patients quickly. And, of course, you know, we're in the middle of Boston where we have three or four huge trauma centers within miles of each other that was also helpful. But talking about getting treatment, triage, and transport right away, uh, that is credited to having saved so many lives during this, uh, this event in Boston. So I'm going to talk a little bit now, and this will be the last thing about the recent active shooting drill we had in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, first, the participants, this drill did, uh, involved multiple local police and fire agencies, emergency management, homeland security, uh, the FBI, our regional SWAT team, for which I'm one of the physicians on CERT, state police, uh, New Hampshire state police SWAT, and uh, EOD, explosive ordinance. Uh, of course, I can't remember the last. Of course, I can't remember the name. Nice. Um, Disposal, I'm sorry. Uh, so about 1,100 hours, 911 received reports of shots fired at the local high school. The callers also were reporting sounds of explosions and that they could see and set and uh, smell smoke. Call immediately went out, and about 10.05, the first law enforcement responding units arrived at the scene. Incident command was set up with senior law enforcement and fire officials on duty. This is what I think you guys will see as well when you have these rescue task force teams. Uh, whomever the ship commander is should be well versed in setting up incident command initially. Uh, and then you guys, um, whomever those senior officials are, can start sending individuals in. Honestly, law enforcement officers, we had, uh, I think, three, three or four cruisers that were there initially um, with uh, the officers with long them making entry into the building to try to get some type of intel back corroborate what 911 was saying, and uh, at least get into the building and give us a sense of what was going on. After that, senior law enforcement fire officials came in and then set up the initial incident command. That command vehicle, at least from the fire side, that command vehicle should have the packs for the rescue task force medics in it, as well as their ballistic equipment. A casualty collection point was established about 150, 200 yards away from the high school. This was the traditional CCP in what would be considered a cold zone. Now, if someone has a good rifle 300 yards, it's not uh, out of the range of possibility to zero in on somebody. Uh, but traditionally, this, this is, uh, might be a little further down, but for the purposes of this, about 150 to 200 yards. Uh, communications uh, went to forward operations to command to identify multiple victims cooperating to 911 calls. So we actually, and you guys may have experienced this, we had a couple incidents of what's called swatting recently, where... Uh, 911 will receive a phone call, hey, um, you know, I'm in a closet in my house, there's an intruder, he had a moment and I could already stab my dad. Uh, 
we activate the team, we all go out, and uh, you know, there's a kid playing Call of Duty or something, and someone set them up. So they activated everything, and we find that the call is not corroborated by what we see on the scene. So one of the important things was this was an incident of swatting or, or it wasn't a hoax. As soon as the initial law enforcement officer got on scene, he confirmed what 911 had said and sent that intel uh, outrage. So um, approach initially with operators in the bear cap and deploy. So SWAT was activated as soon as we had uh, corroboration of uh, an active shooter and that there was uh, either smoke and or explosions on scene. For those of us going, I have a picture of us getting ready to deploy. We typically gather what's called a rally point. We go over the plan, what little intel we have, um, and make the best of um, setting up the plan uh, with whomever else is there to help us out. And then initially, it's simply it's the operators who deploy. Uh, typically, that's in the Bearcat, and then now they were on scene. So now it came back, uh, the cat came back, and both myself and our medic were second in. Within the second uh, wave of operators, the medic actually went into the building, and then I was stationed in the Bearcat just outside of high school. The way this worked was casualties were identified and brought back to the cat as there were uh, actually reports of multiple active shooters. I say multiple active shooters because, as I had said before, we don't want to roll an ambulance up to a scene where there's still an active threat. And here's a big either red and blue, I'm sorry, red and white uh, ambulance coming up and someone take a couple shots at the cab and or the back. So we figured the best way to extract the initial casualties, we got them right out of the building and got them right at the back of the cab. Uh, the, the driver of the cab was also a SWAT operator and took us back to the casualty collection station. I'll tell you this, as they were bringing people back, People were looking at the back of the cat and saying, you're the doc, right? Yeah, okay, well, here's what they have. Well, with my two to three, my supplies for two to three victims, which I knew in my own mind I shouldn't be using on victims coming out, they should be reserved in case you have to come in and if someone heard of the team, I want to rapidly utilize those supplies on patients coming out just because the whole concept of this is rapid intervention as soon as possible. What I wound up doing is snagging a burst in bag, thinking about a real world scenario from one of the ladder trucks and then taking that back with me to continue um, to try to have enough supplies as casualties were brought up from, from the scene. So just to throw a wrench into the works, 911 then received a second call reporting multiple gunshots fired at the middle school in addition to reports of additional explosions. So now we're looking, we're looking at that scenario where our resources are now going to be paused or halved. The state police SWAT unit, which was supposed to come and help us get through the high school because we had so much real estate to deal with to secure it, was now redirected to the middle school. We on CERT continued our operations at the high school. Fire set up a second command post at the middle school. So what are some of the things that we took away from this as it started to wind down and get everyone out? Well, we're still awaiting the official after action plan. As I say, I was not in the talk during this operation. I was out of range. So I had uh, somewhat limited access to it. I participated in both the quick hot wash for law enforcement and uh, fire services. And this is kind of what we took away from it. I knew I quickly ran out of supplies in the back of the cat and patients were coming up to me essentially not having been treated. And that's okay. That's, that's the whole purpose of these rescue task force teams, to get medical personnel in there with appropriate supplies and knowledge to be able to take care of these patients as soon as possible. Some team members actually started treating patients with their own med kits. Now, I challenge anyone to walk by a bleeding six-year-old and not take whatever they have to treat them. But ideally, what would happen is everyone would keep their own med kits for themselves in case they get hurt, and we would have uh, additional medical personnel coming in right on the heels once the area is cleared to be able to treat these patients. Uh, extraction limitations were a real threat. Now, I, previously, I hadn't really considered this. But, you know, shame on me. But I was like, no, we can just roll the ambulance up once we have it very secure. But if we still have someone who's running around either the second or third floor of the building who can just stick a rifle out the window and start popping shots off at the ambulance, we're not going to want to roll an ambulance right up to the uh, right up to the entrance of the building that we're trying to extricate from. So really, the cat played a huge role uh, in really kind of defense and protection. And I'll discuss it in another context in a minute, but definitely with at least getting those patients out to get them to a safe casualty collection point in the triage area. What's going to be interesting is during the official after action plan, 
I was pretty impressed when they set up the scenario. And this was a multi-year planned, huge scenario we did. They're looking at timing from when the first 911 call came in to the interventions to reds and yellows. Uh, as you guys are familiar with, you know, red, uh, significant injury, immediate red, yellows, not so much, and then green, walking, wounded. They looked at the time of first intervention to the reds and yellows to see how we would have done had these patients actually taken a GSW to the chest, the gut, or to an extremity. And it's going to be interesting to break those times down and see what we can do to improve. And again, I think that one of my take homes from this, and I'm going to participate in the after action plan, hopefully with both uh, law enforcement and Port with Fire, is the need for these rescue task force teams so that we can keep our guys with guns, our operators, focused on neutralizing the threat to minimize further risk and loss of life. Additionally, have these medics in play so that they can do their role of immediate treatment and triage and then work about evac as well. Um, let me just see, because I want to talk about. So interestingly, EMS in the hospital had a steady slow pace of patients when I met and uh, spoke with them after said, hey, how'd this go on your guys? Is it, was it crazy? You guys transporting too much? And what happened was because of, and again, I think it's from real estate, how much real estate we had to get through to actually clear an area, identify and get patients out. And we had scenarios set up where the doors were locked, they were chained, we had to get in. Uh, which is not unreasonable or unrealistic. Uh, from an EMS and hospital standpoint, it wasn't this all of a sudden the floodgates open, so they actually wound up doing pretty well with all of this. So, before I get into just a couple of pictures, one of the things I'm going to take away from this, at least me personally, and if any of you guys are operators with your local SWAT teams, I'm going to get a trauma kit and supply it as if uh, for an RTF in the back of the cap. The last thing I want is to have people bring patients up to me as they're bleeding out and I don't have equipment for them or to be able to treat them. Uh, this scenario, it almost, without even having discussed it immediately through the CAC into the position of makeshift ambulance and myself as primary medical intervention and contact, uh, again, which I said, it wasn't really anticipated. So we're definitely going to, I'm going to supply the CAC with uh, uh, a first in bag. Uh, at least to treat those initial six to eight victims. And if I kind of run out of supplies, I can always snag some from the fire department. But I'm going to make sure that that's one of the things I do uh, moving forward. That's at least one of the take homes for me. So this is us at what I refer to as the rally point and getting ready to deploy some members of the team. And here's the cat and ready to go on scene. This was our incident command, which I said was, you know, as I said, we said about 200 yards out. We have this, our fire chief, Chief Achilles, with our uh, police chief, Chief Boyd. So we had everyone talking to each other, which was good because, I, as you guys know, communication is essential. The commander of the CERT team is here as well. He's, he might be hiding behind the truck here. But everyone was on the same page and everyone was talking to each other. And at the quick hot wash, one of the compliments we got was that everyone communicated well, which I think, as you guys know, is something that could easily go awry especially after that second uh, activation where now the middle school was getting into trouble in addition to the high school that really threw a wrench in the works, but communications continued to uh, go fairly smoothly. So this is myself in the back of the cat with the operator. I highlight this because if you guys can see in the distance here, this is an IED, all right? We had state and FBI EOD on board with us. And at this point, we had there are two interesting takeaways from this. At this point, we had already gone up to three false devices and had determined it was just, a, one was just trash, one was a fridge, but this was an actual device with several trip wires going up the railing and to the door. Now, I say this because there are several threats to the rescue task force team above and beyond simply the, the shooter. There may be IEDs out there that have not yet gone off, so when we're talking about training guys and training them tactically, we're not going to get a big conversation about how to disarm this, but we are going to at least talk about keeping eyes on and being situationally aware that there are multiple threats, one of which may be an IED that either hasn't been discovered or hasn't gone off yet. So conversations like don't click your mic if you need the IED, always keep your eyes open as soon as you see it, mark it off and just back off. Those are conversations that should be had in addition to familiarizing um, the rescue task force teams with law enforcement weapons, not only how to use them, but how to make them safe should an operator or law enforcement officer become injured and should they have to play that role of uh, making, making the weapon safe. 
I put this in here because this was pretty interesting. This is a portable x-ray device that the state police had. It's a $60,000 device. And basically, this is assembled and goes over the device to let us know if it actually is something we need to worry about, if it's a hoax, or if it's just trash. And now, this is one of my last slides. And this is something interesting that I don't know if you guys have dealt with yet. But now, we had two separate issues we were discussing at the state level. One was rescue task force teams, and the other, uh, we had a recent event here where we had fire used as a weapon. So the other, the other, I hate to use the term interesting, but the other topic we need to discuss is fire being used as a weapon. This becomes particularly challenging for a number of reasons. On this scene, they simulated fire as a weapon. They had the guys like those put it up. And this was interesting because where this picture is being taken from is the back of the cat. The cat provided protection and security to get um, firefighters out there to be able to put this out under some protection because there was still an active threat. But at this point, the fire was becoming an issue that had to be dealt with. It was set up as a scenario where it couldn't just burn. It was set up as a scenario where it wouldn't just go out, that we actually had to actively engage. So the cat has actually positioned itself up in the grass between the building and the firefighters to be able to allow them to address this issue. So um, I think next on the list that you guys will be seeing, if you haven't seen it already, is addressing fire as a weapon as well in these types of situations. How do we do it? How do we do it safely? So just quickly in review, the evolving world of EMS and many threat scenarios, we've gone from that stage downwind at the cold zone, and at the after action plan for Sandy Hook, the colonel of the state police clinic said, wow, you guys are waiting for this scene to be cold, it's gonna take me about three to four hours to clear this whole area and make sure that there are no other threats. So clearly that's far too much time passing between initial insult and getting some help to the individuals or victims. TECC is just the change in tactics and mindset from traditional pre-hospital medicine. You have to make that mental adjustment and do the most amount of good for the most amount of people in the least amount of time, being appropriately equipped to be able to do so and having that mindset that, yes, I have to treat you a lot. It's not patient abandonment. It's similar to MCIs, which we train for anyway, that mindset. The difference between traditional tactical medicine, medics and docs, as I say myself in my role in the CERT team, versus uh, the role of the rescue task force teams. Cooperation and collaboration amongst agencies is essential. I think this is obvious, but once you get all the players to sit down at the table, at least you can start having the conversation and humor out some issues and or objections. Uh, for example, uh, the one that I addressed with how am I going to outfit 20 operators uh, or 20 uh, medics with ballistic equipment, we can help answer those questions and come up with solutions so we can move forward to this. And last thing I'll say before questions, the reason I'm doing this, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, both of which are going to be in the Northampton school system next year. I think we all have a vested interest as far as community and families to try to make this work. We've seen a number of tragedies recently, and the only thing we can do from those is try to learn and move forward to help mitigate, uh, mitigate the consequences of anything coming down. Thanks, Chris. I'll let you kind of... Okay, one second. Get myself back. All right, thank you, Harry. You can see me now. Uh, thank you to Eric for doing that. Um, I, I would bring up a couple of things uh, I'm curious about in the future is will EMS go? If you have ambulance providers arriving on scene um, and there's an active or immediate threat scenario going on, how many of those will actually go in behind police and say, I'm going to accept the threat? of going to rescue task force into a building, into a mall, into a school, um, and put themselves at risk. For my medics, we, the parents we've been teaching my class for years, their mentality is don't go into the scene safe. Now we're changing things up and asking them to go into places where the scene's not safe. Um, I know Harry's group is getting some holistic vests and protection for their uh, providers. Around this area, we don't have the same um, finances that will um, support buying those for providers. Um, that's one concern I have. The second concern I have, I don't have an answer for right now, is how do we train the average provider? Um, in the Syracuse area, we have Rural Metro, a large paid service. And then outside of Syracuse, we have multiple combined agencies with um, 
a combination of paid paramedics and volunteer paramedic, paramedics and uh, basics uh, supporting them. Um, how do we get training to all of these folks and all the police departments? Uh, I did a scenario with a local SWAT team about six months a year ago, and they actually brought in some police off the street, and the police officers didn't know how to move with a SWAT team. So you have police officers and EMS not trained trying to do this. There's a lot of issues I see with Rescue Task Force. I do think it's the future um, to, to know how to make this work over the long term for a large volume of providers and law, for, law enforcement. I think that's going to be the trick. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts, they can unmute themselves and ask. Um, I know we've gone over a little bit. But... Uh, any other questions from the group? I'm looking at my other computer. And if they're not, you have to unmute yourself first. Perry, Eric, I, any questions? I got a couple questions real quick, Perry. Um, to go back to the, um, the tourniquets, um, I'm going to ask, are you aware of any data that shows there's a risk to the limb after placement of a real, like a non-improvised tourniquet, like an actual cat or, or uh, soft tea or... Uh, type tourniquet, a design tourniquet, uh, presumably less than four to six hours is what we're looking at. And, you know, the previous data from uh, operating theaters showed that four to six hours uh, of ischemia causes no injury to the uh, nerves or, or muscles or heart causes any compartments in the room like that. And that was old data. Is there new data from actual battlefield use tourniquets that kind of leads you to believe that you should put that tourniquet distally rather than up high, or is that just you're coming up for that, with that for a different reason? So the um, the only study that's out there that anyone will hang their hat on is a study with inflating VP cuffs in the OR in a very controlled environment. Right. Everything else is extrapolated or assumed, and actually that study gives you two hours. That's the most that anyone will hang their hat on to say it's safe to leave a tourniquet on without risking tissue ischemia. Um, so that's what I'm basing that off of. A lot of the data coming out, uh, as you had said in the theater, that was, uh, I haven't seen that good published study on that, that someone will hang their hat on. So you definitely have four to six hours before this has to come off. Now, in our scenario, while we do have Portsmouth Hospital as a trauma center, we're looking at getting the patient uh, initially at the scene, extricating them perhaps to a casualty collection point, then getting them to a hospital or a helicopter, and then flying them out to a tertiary care facility. So I can see the, the time becoming an issue as far as getting further and further along. Uh, but to answer your question, I haven't seen any particular study. The only one I came across when developing this that anyone would hang their hat on is that controlled two-hour study in the OR essentially with BP cuffs. Okay, and then I had one other question for you, um, and I realize this is a state-to-state -state debate, but uh, for example, in the state of New York, you had mentioned uh, de needle decompression by law enforcement officers. In the state of New York, there's some, there's some scuttlebutt by uh, a couple of individuals, you know one of them who happens to be a tall fella uh, with some relationship with the Department of Health. Who believes, or at least made the offhand casual statement that the decompression, because it involves placing an instrument into a human being, is practice of medicine. And so, if a law enforcement officer, even though duly trained, were to perform a new decompression, he would consider that practicing medicine without a license. I rebuttal to him was actually that's called tactical first aid, and it's well within the scope of the training that we've provided. But what's your take on this idea that maybe we're putting these guys in jeopardy of being accused of practicing medicine? Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I think that that is a huge debate. And then the question is, well, does the, you know, does OEMS now become involved? Do people have to get certified? I'll give you an example. We're now rolling out Narcan for law enforcement officers. The training program in this state is eight hours long because it deals with airway issues, appropriate uh, BBM utilization, in addition to simply an intranasal Narcan, in addition to simply giving intranasal Narcan when in many areas it's actually available either over the counter or with prescription. Um, so there are a lot of hands in the pot, and I think that that would have to be a debate. Um, ugh, it, it's tough to say. I can tell you right now, we're not doing that in New Hampshire right now. 
Uh, I had given it some thought, but it wasn't a fight I really wanted to have because I think we're going to be close enough to be able to do these things with either medics and or myself, the other physician and the medic on the team. So to try to train everyone to do that and, you know, again, it has been demonstrated it can be done. I think it's kind of difficult to put that scenario in those operators' hands. And you're right, it does raise the question now, are you practicing medicine without a license? Um, you know, is this malpractice or whatever it is, should you have a bad outcome? And I don't think a lot of people are willing to take that on right now. I think the more, um, the smaller issue that I think we can potentially deal with is our basic level providers, if they take, uh, for example, one of the ways we do this is roll out a video from our state medical control board. We'll have them take a post test. Can we roll something out to expand their scope of practice in a tactical medicine unit so that they are now allowed to do a little compression as our medics and advanced DMTs are? I think that would maybe be a first initial step we could undertake, get that approved, and then maybe we could see if incidences do come up where law enforcement officers having the knowledge and capability of performing a needle decompression would have been helpful. I think we would have to establish a need first before we took that kind of drastic step. And if you indulge me, I have one last question. Who are, your, who are your medics working for? Are they working for an EMS agency or are they working for uh, the law enforcement agency? And if so, how are they practicing without being under an agency? So uh, on the, uh, as far as us as tactical medics affiliated with the SWAT team, it's a uh, fire department medic in both myself and another doc. As far as state police SWAT, they have no physicians affiliated with them. They have a medic who's also a sworn trooper. That's their medical personnel. With regards to Derry Fire and the Rescue Task Force team, that's a munip uh, the municipal service, Derry Fire, who's running that. Uh, as of now, there are no private services that I'm aware of that are involved in either rescue task force teams and or uh, supplementing tactical teams within the state. Okay. Hey, I had one Anyone? question. If, if, Go ahead. It's uh, Dr. North at East Carolina University. And I know we're over time. And uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Really do appreciate it. Um, could you comment very briefly on blind insertion airway devices and, and their use in the tactical environment? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. We're talking about uh, kings or LMAs and what, what we may try to utilize out there. I can tell you right now, I personally, I carry uh, a king in my own airway, uh, I'm sorry, in my own bag. Uh, with regards to rescue task force teams, I have not seen anything out there uh, promoting these uh, additional airway adjuncts. Reason being is oftentimes when we're talking about an advanced airway, you, oftentimes we need a supply of oxygen at the same time and we simply don't have that. I think that should a king or other similar device be necessary uh, down the road, that would either be at a re-triage or a casualty collection point. There's several risks including dislodging the tube, um, as you say blind insertion devices carry their own risks. I think above and beyond an NPA there hasn't been demonstrated um, any benefit as far as I know of or any recommendation to carry these on the teams simply because if it's a bit more of an advanced intervention such as starting a line and giving the leader saline if, if warranted that would be better handled by medics uh, down at the collection uh, casualty collection point where they're set up to re-triage and treat and route to the hospital. Any other questions from the group? Okay. Um, a quick plug. Uh, on next month, we don't have a topic or presenter yet. We will work on that. If you are interested, I uh, want to demonstrate what your shop does. Let me know. We do have Jeremy Cushman and Mike Daly. Uh, Jeremy from Rochester and Mike from Albany. Uh, talking September and November. Um, and other dates are to be discussed or to be announced. Uh, I want to thank Gary again for doing this. Um, he's obviously involved in his state and his uh, region in terms of EMS and uh, rescue task force training, and uh, I appreciate his talk today. Otherwise, thank you for coming, and uh, we will see you next month.